Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the New America Foundation. My name is Matteo Faini, and I'm a fellow here in the International Security Program. Um, intelligence sharing, the topic we'll discuss today, is a topic whose importance is widely acknowledged, especially in the fight against terrorism, but that rarely gets discussed publicly. Now, in order to have a, a meaningful and insightful dis uh, discussion on this topic, I had to combine academic expertise with professional expertise, both at the highest levels. So let me start with the academic side. Let me introduce you to Professor James Walsh. Uh, professor Walsh is a professor of political science from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. He is the author of the award-winning book, The International Politics of Intelligence Sharing, and he has published widely on the effectiveness of drone strikes, use of torture, and even European integration. Professor Walsh's book, at least in my opinion, is the best social scientific work on the subject of intelligence sharing. Next to Professor Walsh, we have Professor David Geo. Uh, Professor Geo combines both professional expertise and academic expertise. He is the assistant professor of history at West Point and a history fellow for the Army Cyber Institute. He began his career as in the FBI and the National Security Division, then moved on to the CIA's Counterterrorism Center, first as an analyst and then as an operations officer. He then decided that chasing spies and hunting terrorists was not cool enough for him, so he decided to go back to school and obtain a PhD from Cambridge University in intelligence history. And by the way, Cambridge is, to this day, the best place where to study intelligence history. I think they're trying to make up for all the damage they caused to Western intelligence <laughs> over the ages. Uh, he wrote his dissertation on the special intelligence relationship between the US and the UK from World War II to the mid-1960s. And last, but certainly not least, our keynote speaker, General Hayden. I won't go over his entire CV because that would take up the, all the time we have, but I'll just give you some highlights. Um, a career Air Force intelligence officer who rose th through the ranks all the way to becoming a four-star general, which is something very remarkable and very unusual for an intelligence officer. He was commander of the Air Force Intelligence Agency in 1996-1997. He then became director of the National Security Agency from 1999 to 2005, then principal deputy director of national intelligence, and finally director of the Central Intelligence Agency from 2006 to 2009. Now, if that's not enough for you, he was also quarterback in his high school football team. And I'm sure you always had very good intelligence in the opposing team's playbook. Now, after Spending his career in government service, he joined the Chertov Group, and he has become a frequent commentator on national TV and on the Washington Times. And I must say, he's not someone who shies away from controversy. Now, without further delay, I will pass the floor to Professor Walsh. Each one of our speakers will speak for approximately 15 minutes, then I will ask one or two questions, and then we will open up to questions from the audience. So, Professor Walsh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Matteo. So uh, as Matteo mentioned, I'm a, I'm a social scientist, so I think about um, intelligence sharing as a problem of international cooperation. How can countries uh, c with divergent interests come together to realize uh, mutual or joint gains by sharing intelligence? Um, and so what I'd like to do is spend a couple of minutes talking about why intelligence sharing is a, a particularly difficult cooperation problem to solve, basically because uh, both sides have good and legitimate incentives to keep their intelligence collection practices uh, secret. Um, talk about some ways that, his, that countries can overcome these barriers to select successful collaboration. And then uh, try to apply this to some historical cases and contemporary cases. So if we think about sort of the global distribution of intelligence capabilities, the US is really unmatched in a number of areas, right? In terms of uh, what I might call technical collection, uh, in terms of global sourcing, and in terms of global analysis, right? No other country has the intelligence uh, capacity and budget and expertise of the United States. But at the same time, it seems like the United States, uh, this is an area where the United States can benefit a lot 
from collaboration with other countries, right? In particular, it can benefit from uh, more localized knowledge and intelligence, human intelligence sources uh, from countries around the world. And it seems like that would be particularly important for the United States because it has a, a global set of interests. Uh, now, the problem with intelligence, the, the sort of intellectual problem with intelligence sharing as a form of cooperation is that it's difficult to observe if your partner is living up to the terms of an agreement. And this is, this is, I think, this is true for lots of areas of international collaboration, but it seems to me it would be particularly severe for sharing of intelligence, or, or really for sharing of secret intelligence, right? Be, and the reason it's difficult is because the intelligence is supposed to be secret. The country with which you might be uh, sharing intelligence has uh, good reasons to keep its sources and methods and conclusions secret from maybe even other branches of its own government, right? Much less foreign governments. Um, um, so how do, you, how do you sort of penetrate that, uh, that barrier of secrecy as an outside partner, as a, as a second country, to determine if uh, another country is living up to their promises to share? Now, so far I thought, thought about this as from the perspective of the United States, but I think actually partners of the United States have to uh, have s somewhat similar concerns about the United States. Uh, one thing I want to talk about a little bit later on is how uh, things like WikiLeaks and the Snowden revelations have maybe altered other states' perceptions of the value and credibility of sharing intelligence with the United States. So the, the puzzle here is how can countries cooperate to capture these joint gains that they can accrue from sharing intelligence while also minimizing the problem of cheating by their partners. Uh, by cheating, I mean not living up to the, to the implicit or explicit terms of an agreement to share intelligence, when detecting that cheating is so difficult to do. So in uh, international politics, there's sort of two ways to, to think about resolving a problem like this. One is to select your partners carefully, right? To select partners with whom, with, in whom you have a lot of trust, right? You trust not to cheat on a sharing agreement. Um, so this is, a, this is a good solution, and as I'll suggest a little bit later on, it's one that's often pursued. Um, the difficulty is, there are really two difficulties. One is, is that that may sharply diminish the range of countries that you can collaborate with, right? And it seems to me that it's often the countries that are l somewhat less trustworthy have the most valuable or useful intelligence, right? So you could be, uh, uh, by following this rule strictly, you could be cutting off a lot of potentially useful collaboration. The other difficulty is, and that flows from that is, is that it also would require a country like the United States to further expand its own cap capabilities to, to gather and collect intelligence, right? Uh, so we'd have to, to be able to do more of this on its own. Another solution is what we might call trust but verify, right? So this is uh, the sort of domain of traditional international efforts to collaborate where you try to mitigate mistrust and concerns about cheating through things like um, um, third party monitoring um, um, or the ability to punish another country's reputation if they, if they cheat on an agreement to uh, share intelligence. If you think about like an arms control agreement, arms control agreements typically often have many of these provisions, right, for some sort of independent or third party monitoring and the implicit um, threat to a country's reputation if they engage in cheating that's detected. Now these, these mechanisms are difficult to pursue in the area of intelligence sharing. Intelligence sharing arrangements are often secret, so it's difficult to threaten another country's reputation when they cheat because you don't want to make the, the larger sort of um, um, agreement, detail, uh, the, at least the details of it, public. Um, and it can also be difficult to, to monitor compliance by an outsider, right? Uh, and it's certainly not something that would be easily trusted to a third party. So it, in my book, I suggest that there's another way that countries can address these dilemmas, and I think it's one that um, has not been clearly identified till this point and one that's actually pursued quite often. In fact, it maybe even seems like the sort of normal state of affairs, but when you look at it in the context of other types of agreements to uh, cooperate and to share information, uh, I think it's quite distinctive. And, and the idea is basically to create a sort of hierarchical relationship between the countries that are sharing intelligence. You have a, a lead state or a dominant state that sort of sets the terms of the arrangement, um, compensates the subordinate with material rewards like its own intelligence or diplomatic support, and a subordinate that um, gives up some of its autonomy uh, by allowing the, direct, the dominant state to engage in more sort of direct monitoring of its compliance with the agreement. Uh, so some specific ways that this could be carried out would be 
like, uh, for example, seconding personnel, right, from one country's uh, military or intelligence agencies to, to another country's. And clearly this has the, the, the objective of building the partner state's capacity, right, to collect and analyze intelligence. And that's really important, and that's an important part of the, the joint gains that they hope to capture. Uh, but at the same time, it would probably give the dominant state some inside information, or at least insight, into what's going on in, in the partner country. Uh, another mechanism might be financial assistance. So if the dominant country helps finance the subordinate country's intelligence service, that's a benefit that presumably could be uh, withheld in the future if, if there was not good compliance. Uh, and then a third mechanism might be training the uh, intelligence personnel in the subordinate country. And again, this has sort of direct benefit as well if you can increase their capacity to do their jobs. But it seemed to me it would also have some indirect capacity to address sort of the trust and cheating issue that I've talked about. Uh, you can um, socialize uh, intelligence personnel in other countries to sort of the American way of collecting and analyzing intelligence uh, and maybe uh, gain more insight into what's going on locally through them. So um, let me talk about a couple of historical examples. I think a, an interesting comparison here is between, in the Cold War, uh, between U.S. intelligence sharing with Great Britain and with what, the country that became West Germany. Now, both of these countries had intelligence that was of great value to the United States. Um, but they really differed on the, tr on the level of trust. The, the UK was, of course, uh, very closely trusted. The US had, a, a, at that point, a very uh, long history of sharing intelligence with them, or a deep history, maybe, is a better way to put that. Um, West Germany, though, had, uh, was less trustworthy, right? There was, wasn't clear the direction of the, the occupied ter territories, how they would evolve into what sort of country they would evolve into. Uh, and there was a lot of potential for penetration by the Soviet Union and East Germany. So uh, in, in this case, the U.S. took very different approaches towards managing their relations with these two countries. In the case of the U.K., it was more of sort of a traditional arm's length uh, arrangement where the two partners met on more or less equal terms uh, and, and, and trusted each other's intelligence, probably maybe more so than in any other case in, in recent history. Um, but in the case of Germany, the U.S. took a very different approach. It really uh, helped establish and really literally directly managed the, the developing West German intelligence service, uh, provided it with most of its finance, at least in its early years, and, and really set its uh, key objectives uh, for a number of years into the 1950s. And so if you look at the um, declassified documents, uh, CIA documents from the period, it's, it's very clear that the, the people at the CIA were concerned about cheating by their West German collaborator and took these steps with the del deliberate intention of, of minimizing the risk from that. Uh, so let me talk about a couple of contemporary cases. Of course, I have no uh, real inside information here, but I will, uh, as an academic, I will try to uh, apply my framework to every situation that I can find. Um, if you think about, say, the, the current campaign against ISIS, uh, here a, a really useful partner for the United States is Iraq. Uh, because it can help with providing human intelligence and other intelligence useful for, say, targeting airstrikes. Um, but at the same time, there must be, I imagine there are concerns about the reliability of the Iraqi partner. Um, and so maybe this helps explain um, some of the arrangements that have been worked out where U.S. military personnel have been sent in small numbers to Iraq, not, of course, to engage in military operations, but to help uh, coordinate and oversee the process. Um, one other thing I want to point out is that the, the partner country of the United States has to have similar concerns uh, about the United States. In other words, the partner country, so far I've thought about this is from, a, from an American perspective. How does the United States manage its relationships with potentially less than trustworthy partners? But if other countries might worry that the United States could be less than trustworthy as well. And I think that the, um, uh, the for example, the WikiLeaks and Snowden revelations have the potential anyways to undermine um, uh, other countries' trust in the United States' ability. Not that these were deliberate attempts by the United States, of course, to undermine that trust, but it may have had that as sort of a, a spillover effect. Um, so one thing to think about, too, is, is that in structuring these relationships, how can the United States, what steps can the United States take to reassure its partners um, of its reliability? And I think that this is a, a, another important angle. If we think about the case, for example, of West Germany, another thing that the United States did was it did not completely control the West German intelligence service. And over time, 
uh, gave it more autonomy and more space. Um, and, and there were a lot of practical reasons for that. But one reason was that it did allow, it did make the United States basically vulnerable to Germany if they decided to stop or limit their cooperation. Um, and so, and that was a really important move, I think, historically by the United States because it showed that the United States had at least a moderate amount of trust in its partner and was willing to try to move in a direction of a more cooperative relationship, which seems to have happened. Um, so I wonder, too, in closing, I wonder how um, that insight might be applied to uh, the, the sort of problem of insider threats uh, that the United States and, of course, other countries face, but in particular thinking about its implications for uh, intelligence sharing partners of the United States. If there's a way that the U.S. could reassure its partners about that it's taking uh, you know, concrete steps to uh, minimize or reduce this problem, uh, that would seem to be very valuable. The, the trick there, though, is, is that how can it take how can the United States take those concrete steps to reassure its partners while not at the same time also revealing um, you know, important counterintelligence measures that it's taking uh, to prevent this from happening in the future? So let me stop there. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. Matteo. Professor Gio. Well, thanks very much um, <clears throat> to Matteo and uh, to the New America Foundation for having me and for organizing what I think is, an, is a panel on a very important topic. Before I start, let me just emphasize that these are my own views and do not necessarily reflect any United States government uh, position or endorsement. I, I thought I'd uh, start by offering a few personal anecdotes, which I think illustrate uh, why studying liaison relationships in particular is fascinating, and also uh, how I personally became interested in studying uh, intelligence liaison as an academic discipline in its own right. Um, it always struck me as strange that during my previous career as a CIA officer, that I might have a liaison meeting with my British counterparts, for example, and tell them information that I, I might not be able to tell other CIA uh, officers in my station. Um, you know, the folks who are trustworthy, discreet, held very high security clearances, and who shared my mission, my employer. Uh, we all worked for General Hayden. Um, likewise, uh, during my time as a Naval Reserve Intelligence Officer, I participated in uh, some combined exercises with the Australian Navy. And uh, the intelligence spaces in any building are always well policed and secure. Uh, checking badges uh, of folks wanting to come in or leave is, um, is, is a routine uh, security precaution. And I guess just stepping back for a second, I found it bizarre that a 21-year-old Australian able seaman could walk in and out as he pleased, but I would have to actually politely uh, stop or turn away um, or turn on the red visitor light. Um, if, a, if a senior American officer would, would come by who didn't necessarily have the same clearances. And, uh, you know, that senior officer shared my uniform, uh, my citizenship, outranked me by orders of magnitude, and yet, unlike the Australian able seaman, could just come and go, or he wasn't, he wasn't permitted to enter. And thus, my interest was piqued uh, to, to start to answer questions uh, about how this bizarre uh, <coughs> turn of events came to be. You know, if you're a Martian looking down on Earth and you're, you're looking at intelligence sharing, that, that might be a bizarre thing you might want to might check out. Um, so, you know, why do we do this and, and how did it develop? And so for me as, as a historian, uh, that's, that's how I, I come to approach this. Uh, as Matteo mentioned, my uh, area of expertise uh, is, is the, the uh, intelligence liaison in the Anglophone world. And so I'd like to talk about the development of uh, different types of intelligence liaison, human and SIGINT in particular, uh, with a special uh, um, emphasis on the U.S.-U.K. Uh, relationship. But before I get into that, I wanted to make a few comments about intelligence liaison generally, because I think being precise with what we're actually talking about in terms and concepts uh, will be helpful during the Q&A period. Uh, I think that uh, although intelligence sharing and cooperation, sometimes referred to as intelligence diplomacy, routinely takes place, to me that's not the most interesting phenomenon. Uh, two relatively hostile states can still cooperate to some degree when faced with a common uh, interest or, or a shared threat. Likewise, intelligence sharing uh, in itself isn't necessarily that remarkable all the time. Uh, the recent Al Jazeera leaks illustrate sometimes how prosaic uh, intelligence liaison can be. So to me, the real, the real litmus test of the strength of the relationship uh, gets more into the sharing of sourcing information um, and or running those sources uh, jointly. And along those same lines, uh, I'm more interested in considering why and how some states develop um, uh, agreements, so-called no-spy agreements, where they actually sort of unilaterally say, okay, we're not going to do this, and also that they respect the so-called no-poaching rule, 
uh, which uh, basically states that if one service is one friendly service is closer to uh, to recruitment of a, of a foreign intelligence target, that the other service will actually back off and, and let the let the recruitment attempt proceed. Um, intelligence and security services, I think, by their nature, are insular, and there's lots of obstacles to cooperation, uh, political considerations, risk calculations, competing fo uh, foreign policy objectives, uh, com competing commercial interests, and of course, just the inherent competition in the international system. Um, I like the words of war theorist Karl von Clausewitz. Uh, if you're a West Point professor, you can't actually go through a lecture without <laughs> mentioning Clausewitz or they, uh, they, they revoke your, your job. Um, but Clausewitz said, you know, uh, quote, one country may support another's cause, but will never take it so seriously as it takes its own. Uh, and to me, that's, uh, that's really been, been the case. Um, that said, when intelligence services do overcome these obstacles, they can actually cooperate to achieve uh, synergistic outcomes. And once uh, what I would call force multiplication is achieved, success breeds success, and the relationship can, can then deepen and, uh, and expand in scope. It has something to build on. Uh, in, the terms, uh, sorry, in the words of intelligence historian Rodri Jeffries Jones, the liaison process, quote, cements alliances, and good friends share secrets, and the sharing of secrets makes for good friends. Uh, however, it's critical to remember that intelligence liaison relationships are dynamic and they, re they change in response to inputs, say Edward Snowden or, or WikiLeaks or, or other global developments, ISIS, Putin, uh, whatever. Uh, so I think it's helpful to think of liaison relationships as somewhere on a spectrum uh, at any given time. And state pairs can move up it and they can move down it. Uh, and they're certainly not all created equal. Uh, to describe or characterize liaison relationships themselves, I like the term granularity. Uh, which refers to the specificity of the intelligence or its source or collection method. And it's also important to consider how broad or encompassing intelligence uh, liaison relationships are. For instance, are they ad hoc or, or issue specific? We're going to cooperate on this and then you know, we're going to go back to our, uh, to our corners. Uh, do, or do we have a, a formalized and a global and ongoing relationship? Uh, the latter types are what Bradford Westerfield has called full-fledged uh, relationships. And, and I think that term fits. For the purposes of comparison, just so you, you have some basis, uh, other types of intelligence liaison can include parallel operations. Um, hey, this is what we're doing. We'll keep each other informed. Uh, allocated operations, where we're dividing up the work. And then, of course, joint operations, uh, working together. And that's, that's my particular uh, focus. So again, how do the, uh, the partners move up and down the spectrum of relationships? And how might they increase or decrease the granularity uh, in their relationship? Um, I think in order to move beyond the sort of rather bland memo passing that characterizes many intelligence relationships, I found uh, that common interests and shared threats or perceptions of those threats are necessary but not sufficient to, uh, uh, for what I would categorize as, as full-fledged or most granular. To reach those levels, I found that other ingredients, and again the, the US-UK relationship is my, my primary example, uh, shared values, common language, shared worldviews, history, culture, uh, and even tradecraft philosophy, which uh, I thought um, we could get into. Um, additionally, the role of the individual, uh, often derided nowadays as sort of great man theories of history, I think uh, the individuals actually matter. Um, often pointed to in this area is the friendship and productive working relationship between um, World War II Chief of the Office of Strategic Services, uh, William Wild Bill Donovan, and his, uh, and his British, uh, actually his Canadian counterpart, uh, based in New York, William Stevenson, or Little Bill. Uh, in the words of uh, former Director General of MI5, Sir Stephen Lender, quote, softer issues such as personalities, shared experiences, friends in adversity, etc., may not actually uh, carry political, pu political or public weight, but matter in institutional relationships, particularly when those have an operational element. These joint activities generate friendships, trust with sensitive material, mutual respect and confidence, as well as understanding about constraints and difficulties. They matter, end quote. And I think that's really important. Intelligence uh, liaison isn't done by faceless bureaucracies. It's done by people. Uh, notably, trust, shared goals, common tradecraft, and a litany of other commonalities became both reasons to cooperate, a basis for cooperation, as well as a product or a byproduct of that cooperation. Um, so trust in particular uh, in joint operations, uh, when they go well, becomes self-reinforcing. 
Of course, everything is not uh, roses all the time, and sometimes differences can be significant. And what I look for in cases like that is how quickly a rift can be healed and if the damage can be localized. Uh, the Anglo-American example of the Suez Crisis in 1956 uh, reveals that even sharp disagreements can be quickly overcome uh, if, there's a, if there's a firm foundation. And I think those who focus on the internecine squabbles between the Americans and, uh, and the British intelligence communities that may often make headlines are, are focused on the wrong aspect of the relationship. Having a discussion or even a heated argument about which service should recruit which person of interest is a conversation that other intelligence agencies just simply aren't having with one another in the first place. Um, Instead, they would abide by the law of the intelligence jungle, you kill what you eat. Um, or I think rephrase for our applicability, you get the secrets that you steal. I think it's also uh, important to be careful to define what we're talking about um, in terms of multilateral sharing or bilateral sharing. I think that's really important. Mo uh, bilateral sharing is usually the most uh, comfortable and productive uh, environment for intelligence sharing. I think uh, much less gets done in multilateral forums uh, with the, again, notable exception of the Five Eyes communities. And I think one axiom that, that I've found to be true in almost all cases that I know of, I'm happy to hear of others, is that as the number of countries involved uh, in the sharing goes up, the sensitivity of that uh, in shared information goes down. Um, I think it's also important to, to distinguish between uh, types of, of collection. We're talk are we talking about HUMINT? Are we talking about SIGINT? human intelligence, signals intelligence, imagery intelligence, uh, and they all have different sharing mechanisms and sharing relationships. So I'd like to say just a few words about human and SIGINT. Uh, the default setting for human is unilateral operations, and even the closest partners would prefer to go unilateral if they can. Why? Well, they're relatively inexpensive. They're not overly resource intensive in terms of agent handling officers. And the fewer uh, parties involved means a lower possibility of intelligence compromise. I think we've already where we heard, uh, heard that hinted at. Uh, nevertheless, there's lots of reasons to cooperate in, in human, and that takes different shapes. Uh, services can declare a human operation, uh, you know, as I said, hey, we're doing this, um, or they can actually run jointly. And I think one of, one of my favorite examples uh, of true cooperation is the joint CIA MI6 uh, operation running so Soviet military intelligence colonel Oleg Pankovsky, who provided critical intelligence in the run-up to the, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, so yeah, and also of course it just comes down to money sometimes. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the default setting for, for SIGINT operations is in fact cooperation. Uh, as I also wear a hat as the uh, history fellow for the Army Cyber Institute at West Point, as uh, Matteo mentioned, I'd be remiss if I didn't take at least a minute uh, to discuss uh, the Five Eyes relationship as it pertains to the development of SIGINT cooperation and cyber cooperation. Uh, unlike human, uh, SIGINT is monstrously expensive, labor-intensive, and geography may matter uh, rather more. If you just consider for a second the amount of technical expertise uh, needed to establish and maintain SIGINT collection systems, the number of analysts needed to translate material, the, anal the, uh, sorry, the linguists to translate the analysts to pour over it, and on and on. Um, these were uh, formalized during World War II uh, through um, Anglo-American agreements in 1943, and then because they worked, they were uh, reformalized or codified again in 1946. Uh, actually, these are just uh, declassified in 2010. And so, um, you know, I think these, these documents or these agreements uh, established a foundation for SIGINT cooperation based on the effective wartime model that, that remains significant even today. Uh, what I found in my own research into the, uh, the SIGINT community is that over the course of the Cold War, the Anglophone SIGINT organizations became intertwined as hedgerows. Uh, making disentangling one from another uh, particularly difficult. Uh, in contrast, there's no um, human bureaucratic intermingling. Uh, let me just uh, close on a few words about the special relationship itself. Um, in reality, there, there is no special relationship. What we refer to rather monolithically um, actually has, has many, uh, many facets, and I think we need to separate out the special intelligence relationship from the broader special political relationship. The intelligence relationship is an expansive patchwork of treaties, formal and informal agreements, overlapping foreign policy and defense goals, and personal relationships uh, that we term in shorthand the special relationship. Uh, this, uh, this relationship was also interpreted differently, um, and actually just was different, um, in different times and in different geographic locations as well. Uh, and of course, it was not necessarily 
equally special to the same people at the same time in the same place. Um, in the main, though, I think it was very durable, and there's good reasons for this. Uh, CIA veteran Ben Fisher uh, observed, quote, the U.S. intelligence community's liaison relationship with the British is its oldest, most important, and closest, both operationally and sentimentally, end quote. In contrast to Fisher, others focus less on the operational nexus and more on the, the sentiment, uh, often mocked as rather saccharine. So here's historian uh, Alex Danchev, quote, Anglo-America is a kind of failed state. The special relationship is not what it was, not what its fervent uh, believers would want it to be. The party is over, but the guests linger, reluctant to separate, spellbound by the storied past. So okay, there's, there's another way to, to, to look at it. And certainly the, uh, the special relationship can be uh, problematic, at least the, the term. And uh, many intelligence officers that I spoke to are quick to point out that it's diplomats and political leaders that use the term. Intelligence officers actually uh, really don't use that term. Uh, but I still think that the product of it is profound. Namely, never before in the history of international relations have two sovereign states opted to work so closely, so often in, on such a wide range of uh, defense intelligence and security matters. Uh, and I'll, I'll close on, on two reasons for why I think this is the case. First, as a consequence of the Second World War, American and British intelligence services cho choose, chose to partner with each other to a degree unique in history. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that was the simple desperation of the British situation in 1940. And the second uh, reason why I think the wartime relationship was so productive is that it continued in the face of the Soviet threat. So without something to push you together and some glue to keep you stuck together, I don't think it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work in the same way. You're not going to be able to reach that, that higher bit of the spectrum. Um, you know, things, things weren't um, you know, all honeymoon since 1941, uh, but overall I think, uh, I think the relationship was important. And that's for, um, for many reasons, including the, the leaders as well. Sure, there's bickering. Sure, there's policy disagreements. Um, and, of course, you have to pay attention to the relationship. It'll go away. As Elie Wiesel observed, the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. Uh, finally, history has shown that in turbulent times, such as 9-11 or 7-7, um, these often serve to refocus, re-energize, and re-engage the special relationship. As a case in point, the 1990s was widely considered a low ebb for the special relationship. But on September 12, 2001, the day after the most devastating attack in American history, a single airplane entered U.S. airspace, and aboard it were the chiefs of MI5, MI6, and GCHQ. So let me close by quoting uh, the great Dean Acheson to a British-American um, group in 1952, but I think it still holds true today. Quote, I shall not bother you by doing what is done so often on occasions like this, of talking about all that we have in common, language, history, all of that. We know all that. What I wish to do is, is stress the one thing we have in common, the one desperately important thing, and that is that we have a common fate. So thanks very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Professor Gio. General Hayden, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mateo. And I think my comments are going to echo some of the fine comments uh, already made by my colleagues here, but perhaps with a, the, this one revolution of more operational spin, because I, I come at this as a practitioner um, far more than I am an academic. So, so let me begin. Uh, Steve Kappas, who was my deputy at CIA, and I, we visited more than 50 countries in the 30 months that we were together at CIA headquarters. That's a big number in a short time. We visited some of those countries more than once, and more than that number of countries visited CIA headquarters at Langwin. In other words, these liaison relationships are a big deal. They're a big deal even for a big intelligence organization like CIA or NSA. The uh, Koreans had some missionaries, Presbyterian missionaries, and of all places, Afghanistan. Uh, a serious error in judgment, I would, I would suggest. And they were captured, captured by the Taliban and were being held for ransom. The president of Korea gave the task of getting them back to the head of NIS, the Korean equivalent of the CIA. And the head of NIS immediately got an airplane and flew to the capital, not Kabul this capital. He came to CIA and he sat down in my office and asked, asked for assistance. 
these relationships mean a lot to both sides. And, and as already suggested by Professor Walsh, here's kind of the macro deal. CIA is global, resource rich, technologically sophisticated. Our partners are almost always quite small. In fact, I was fond of saying that in many cases, I had more lawyers than they had people in their organizations. They're small, but they're focused, and they're linguistically and culturally agile. Far more linguistically and culturally agile than, than big CIA was. And so what you got was this symbiotic relationship in which we could take their very specific information and put it into a broader global context and hence give it more meaning to them than it would otherwise have. And of course, the reverse, the reverse was, was true for us. My standard speech to uh, outgoing chiefs of station was to pay a lot of attention to the liaison relationship. That we would take a call from our counterpart, Steve and I, any time of the day or night. And I would also add, and I said this to the outgoing class of chiefs of station, Look, there are two things I want you to remember here when you're meeting with liaison. Number one, you're the only superpower in the room. And number two, don't act like it. Okay. They already know the first. That's why they're so generous in their meetings with you. They're kind of taking notes on the second, on whether or not you, you act in that way. These relationships already suggested are, are, are fairly immune, and they're not totally immune, but they're fairly immune from the broader political relationship, or at least when the broader political relationship hits transient, turbulent waters. Uh, a classic point that we always, always suggest is even in the run-up to the, to the Iraq War, when the political relationship between our president and the German chancellor was, was so prickly on the issue of Iraq, the intelligence sharing relationship between American intelligence and BND, the, the German service, continued to be rich even, even with, regard to questions, uh, with regard to questions about Iraq, as they actually enabled uh, American planning uh, for that war. The thing you need to keep in mind, and already, already suggested, I think, by Professor Geo is that the interests, the values, and the policies of the United States are never, underscored never, coincident with the interests, values, and policies of a liaison service. I, we're not using slides here, so if you would, just look up here while I, for a moment, use hand puppets. Um, if these are our values and policies and laws and interests, and this is liaison, it's never that. Even when you're meeting in London or Canberra, it's never that. And when you go to some other places, oh, just pick Islamabad out of the air, I guess. It's kind of that. And your job is, well, you know, in terms of values and law, you can't ignore this and they can't ignore that. This is where you're working. It's in that, in that common space of, of common interests and, and, and common activities. Uh, liaison, you can probably get the point already that it was important and interesting. We spent a lot of time on it. And it was very revealing in, in some unusual ways. Um, you could be sitting across the table from uh, a liaison partner and, and having the, the most serious fact-based, which is kind of what intelligence does, serious fact-based discussion you could possibly have and then all of a sudden, it, it happened. And the it is that your partner suddenly went into his nation's or his cultural, culture's creation mythology okay. and, and, and went down a, what I would call a cul-de-sac, describing an event with which you could not possibly agree. Let me, let me give you one example, and it's a very, it, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, a it's a serious one, but it's, but it's an old one, so one, it's easy for me to share. Uh, when I was a brigadier and I was head of intelligence for U.S. forces in Europe, I would go to Serbia 
And, and I would meet with Bronco Kirga, who was the J2 of the Yugos Yugoslavian military, or the rump Yugoslavia's military. This is during the war in Bosnia. And Bronco and I were actually pretty comfortable with one another. He took me off guard in our first meeting when he got out from behind his desk and said, Michael, I feel a great sense of kinship with you. And give me the you know, Slavic hug and kiss and the bread and salt to share. And, okay, why do you feel kinship with me? Number one, we were both born in the same year. Okay, you check my bio. And my grandfather was a steel worker in Pittsburgh. <laughs> ah, okay, Bronco. <laughs> we're together. And we had serious conversations, even though our governments were on different sides of that war in Bosnia. And we were one day more or less drinking lunch at the Yugoslavian Army Club when he talked about the impact of casualties in the Bosnian War. And, 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 and he particularly stressed the impact of casualties on Serbian families, who, who are now one or two child families. Okay. And I, I'm there, I'm, and I'm with him. And then suddenly, with a wave of his hand, but these Muslim families, they have so many children. It matters far less. Back to the creation mythology of the other guy. At which point, you, know, you can't even allow yourself that head nod that we culturally have to say communication acknowledged. You, you've kind of got to go lock forward without, without showing any signs of agreement. So I was, I was in that thinking about that for the longest time. When halfway through my tour at CIA, I was boarding the C-17 for an overnight hop to another liaison service, and I'm sitting back in the, in the comfort pallet there, and maybe getting a glass of wine, it suddenly occurred to me, what part of my conversation with the liaison partner did that very reasonable man across the table from me suddenly say, uh-oh, here we go. Hayden's a pretty good professional, but I'm going to have to stand three or four minutes now of American creation mythology, whether it was the efficacy or almost sanctity of elections, or, or you, you, you know what I mean. So, so I, just want to, I just want to stress to you that there's an art to this science in liaison relationships. By the way, you really need to be careful when you actually do this for a living that when you're not here, but here, you have to be deeply respectful. Even though you want great cooperation, you have to be deeply respectful of what it is your own law and ethics allow you to do. A, a very concrete case in point, uh, as director of CIA, I couldn't aid, abet, advise, or even suggest to a liaison counterpart, that he go and do something that I was not legally authorized to do. I recall one conversation in Tel Aviv with Gabi Ashkenazi, who was the chief of the IDF. And we were there simply sharing ideas as to what can be done to stop the Iranian program. And of course, the core of the Iranian program isn't how much highly enriched or low enriched or medium enriched uranium they might have. The, the core of the uranium program is the knowledge that they're building up in terms of how to go do this. And of course, knowledge is carried around inside human beings. So if you really want to slow the uranium program down, I couldn't even raise that as an abstract possibility. By the way, don't think this is a one-way street. In September 2009, American Navy SEALs killed a fellow named Salah Nabhan in Somalia. Salah was the chief of operations for Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, in Somalia. There was no attempt to capture. This was a kill operation. There is not an intelligence service in Europe, particularly not an intelligence service in, in Western Europe, who could have given the United States information to enable that raid and stay on the right side of their nation's laws. So this is relationships, important as they are, can get very, very complicated. It already suggested some nations are closer than others. I think it was Kissinger who actually said there are no friendly intelligence services, just intelligence services of friendly nations. Okay. And so it should not come as a shock to any of you 
that there are countries in the world who are both partners and targets when it comes to, to foreign intelligence. Intelligence officers know that. Frankly, I, I, I think politicians know that too. Sometimes foreign publics have never digested that reality. And so when you get the story out there already suggested the impact of the Snowden leaks, when you get the story out there that <clears throat> NSA may or may not have been listening to the chancellor's, to the chancellor's cell phone, um, when I was in Munich for the security conference about 15 months ago, Snowden was the news of the day, and I'm doing a, a late night presentation. I mean, it was late night. It was after dinner. It was in the bar. It was official. <laughs> uh, I'm in a room full of Germans, everyone drinking pills and eating palm frites, and I'm on a panel about Snowden. And it came up immediately. Why are you listening to the chancellor? Well, first of all, I neither confirm nor deny what we may or may not have been doing, but I did point out that when Barack Obama, the senator from Illinois, was elected president of the United States, he had pretty much run his campaign from his BlackBerry. And we approached the president-elect after the election and before the inauguration saying, oh, you, you just, you, you, you can't be doing that. And, and he responded, he responded along the line, actually said this on CNBC, CNBC, it sounded a bit like a Second Amendment bumper sticker because he said, they're going to have to pry my Blackberry from my fingers in order to get it. So realizing he did carry Ohio, uh, we said, I guess he's going to keep his Blackberry. <laughs> we said, can we borrow it for a day or two <laughs> just to maybe tighten it up? And, and what, I, what I related to the German audience was that, um, what's the backstory on that, on that, on that dialogue? Um, the backstory of that dialogue is we were telling the soon-to-be most powerful man in the most powerful nation on earth that if he used his BlackBerry in his nation's capital, multiple foreign intelligence services would be listening to his phone calls and reading his emails. And we didn't rend our garments. We, we didn't cry outrage. We just knew that's, that's the way things are. And, you know, that's how adults play in, in the world of espionage. Already suggested, a couple other points I want to make, Professor Geo, that it's easier to share technical intelligence than it is to share human intelligence. And he, and he laid out some very, very concrete reasons uh, why, why that is so. Um, I grew up at NSA as my first national job. I was the director there for six years. And, and there, there are intense cooperative relationships to, as you already suggested, to create signals intelligence. It's, it's almost required. You know, this, this isn't throwing product through the transom at the end of the process. Right? This is way upstream in which the cooperation takes place. And so I, I became accustomed to that level of cooperation. Then I, then I became um, director of, of CIA. I was talking to my deputy, Steve Kappas, a uh, fellow with whom I went to all these capitals. Um, I talked to my director, deputy director, Steve Kappas, and said, Steve, you know, I'm, I'm really accustomed I'm really accustomed to, 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 to key allies being able to come and go inside the headquarters building. And Steve, I'll never forget it. Steve looked me in the eye and says, Mike, I love you like a brother, but that's just not going to happen here. <laughs> Again, the difference between human intelligence and signals intelligence and how it's created. Um, also suggested, and it's easy for me to pivot off some of the key points already made, that, that sometimes you cooperate more with a foreign partner than you may be able to do with others inside your own government. I, I recall one case in point when I was director of NSA, and Jim Clapper, now the DNI, was the director of NGA, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And I'll never forget, Jim, Jim and I used to have these common meetings of our key leadership about every, every month or two. And he turned to me and said, Mike, NSA just needs to share more with NGA. We would like for you to treat us like the British, <laughs> was, was his comment. When you really get to an intimate intelligence sharing relationship, and I, I, I think I've suggested, and, and the scholars up here have already outlined that there are layers, that there are layers of, of cooperation. 
the easiest layer is to share product. You, you throw your end product through the transom. They throw their end product through the transom. You read it. You say thank you. You move on. The next layer of cooperation, the deeper layer, is you actually share not product, but you share production. You cooperate in the creation of intelligence. And then finally, there are a small number of nations around the world, and it is a very small nation around the world, where it is you do not share what you know, or do you, not, you do not share in creating that which is known. The relationship is so intimate that you share what you do not know, that, that you reveal your gaps to that partner. That's a very intimate relationship. It's a small group. But I, I hope you've taken the, the meaning from my comment that the group with whom you have any kind of relationship is actually quite large, occasionally difficult to manage, but it's worth the effort. It's worth the doing. Thank you. Thank you, General. Um, I'll I'll ask the first question uh, on the issue of intelligence sharing and accountability. This is for all of you. Put yourselves in the shoes of someone on a congressional oversight committee. And you see that intelligence sharing is becoming an increasing share of what intelligence agencies do, and yet you have a hard time understanding what it is that they're really doing. What suggestions would you give to this member of Congress on how to have more access to this information and how to make sure that this intelligence sharing is done properly. It, it, it's hard, and I, I'll, I'll be brief because these folks I know have comments. Um, number one, the instinctive critique by some on the oversight committees is that liaison relationships are, are a reflection of you're not doing your job or you're not being able to do your job. It's a reflection of outsourcing rather than I think what the three of us have reflected here is a deeply enriching process and, and well worth the effort. So there is, there, there, there is that, that barrier amongst some, even veteran members of the, of the community. Uh, the, the other problem is that the American system of oversight is, is far more invasive than the systems of oversight of our partners, even our partner Western democracies. So it is not an uncommon thing for a, for a member of the Oversight Committee to show up in, in country X and want to go to Joint Facility Z because he's gone to the identical kind of facility here in the United States and be told by the Chief of Station, you can't do that. What do you mean, you, I can't do that? I'm a member of the Oversight Committee. I went to the facility Y back in America that is very similar to that. Why can't I go to Facility Z? And the answer is because their parliamentarians have never been allowed to go to Facility Z. And, and that, becomes, that becomes a difficult management challenge for us in, 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 in giving oversight enough confidence in what it is we're doing, even though we don't have all the tools available to us, the visit, to show them what we're doing. You want to add something to that? No. Just one quick thing is, is that, you know, it seems like that's a particularly difficult oversight challenge because unlike other international agreements like treaties where the legislature has some say over uh, either implementing them or the ratification, that's not the case here as well, for the most part. I would say that you just have to be substantive as well. Um, you know, when, when I was going through analytical training, um, we actually practiced the so-called elevator brief where there's a busy official and you have 30 seconds and you're pretending to get in the elevator and say, sir, you're going up to the seventh floor. I have you know, 30 seconds to tell you everything you need to know. And I think in, in Congress, um, I, I don't think that's, that, that's the right idea because you simply can't understand this in 30 seconds, these problems, these processes. It's extremely complicated. And so I really think that, you know what, wherever it is that you're going, busy Congress person, um, take the time to educate yourself, to listen to your community, and to learn what's going on. And, uh, and so I think, if, for, for my money, the elevator brief should, should be abolished. If you, have, if you have 30 seconds, I'll come back another time. I wanted to ask you another question on the notion of hierarchy. Um, 
Professor Walsh, in your book, you mentioned that the relationship between the U.S. and Egypt, for instance, is one example of a hierarchical relationship. Uh, that, that leads me to ask, how effective is hierarchy at really controlling what other intelligence agencies are doing? It would be hard to say that Egyptian intelligence has been following America's advice, it, certainly for the past four years. Well, my book was published five years ago. <laughs> right. So, so <laughs> uh, um, well, it does, it does highlight one of the issues with these sort of closer relationships is, is that it does make, uh, like in this case, for example, the United States, um, it, to the extent that they're dependent uh, on another service for uh, valuable intelligence, if that country behaves in a way the United States doesn't like, then um, that, that puts the U.S. in a difficult position. And since they're, if they're, they're cl that, that's a harder problem, the more closely the, the services are entangled, I would imagine. And I have one question for General Hayden, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Could you tell us what your thought process looked like when you had to decide whether or not to share intelligence and what to share with another country? I mean, it, number one, it depends on the other country. And, but, but then it also depends on the totality of circumstances available. I mean, there are narrowly defined circumstances in which a partner, perhaps not one with whom you are routinely intimate, one with whom you have serious trust issues, that this issue is so important that the payoff matches the, the risk, and, and you have to go with the risk. Uh, this, this is after I left government, so I'm telling you only what I read in books and only read, what I read in newspapers. But we lost seven, seven officers at cost because of great rely, re reliance on the Jordanian services vetting of the source, Malawi, on which the whole operation was based. Was that a mistake? No. I, I, I really don't think it was a mistake. Uh, it, it ended badly. But I, I offer you the view that an agency is not willing to take the risk that leads to coast is an agency that never gets to a Badabad. And so you've got to make those very difficult decisions. Okay, well, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Please identify yourself, either with your real name or, for your or with your undercover name. Wait for the microphone and make sure they're questions and they're brief. Okay, so we'll start over there. Oh, okay, well, that's fine then. <laughs> Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. The one with the microphone. It, it will come to you. All right. Uh, sorry for the confusion. Uh, Mark Stout, Johns Hopkins University. Um, I, I think this question is probably for Professor Geo and General Hayden. Are there in the U.S. system, and should there be in the U.S. system, um, occasions on which uh, liaison relationships that might, in principle, be you know fruitful and useful? Um, are not pursued or are cut off just purely on sort of moral grounds. Um, uh, you know, these people are too thuggish. And you could, you could view that as being a, a question about torture. I suppose that is a specific instance of it, but I think it's, I, I'd view it as sort of a broader question of, you know, just too thuggish and, and nasty to be dealt with, even if they could be useful to us. Thanks. <laughs> I almost want to say no, <laughs> but I'm not. Because, because, I mean, we don't have relations with every country around the world. And there are, there are a variety of reasons. Number one, they're not worth the effort. Okay? And, and, and another could be simply the character of the regime. All right? That said, all right, remember, and you get here with tip of fingernail to tip of fingernail, if there is something in there that keeps Americans safer and freer, which is not a legitimate, it's not legitimizing all this hanging out over here, but one has to be careful in that, in that, is that does that transient short-term tactical operational gain compromise your principles out here and all those things for which th th there is not overlap. So I, I, guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is there, 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 there's probably no one that I would dismiss with the comment, under no circumstances would we go to meet with that guy. For God's sake, Steve Kappas, my deputy, he went to meet with Musa Kusa, the, the head of the Libyan service, and actually was, he was kind of the beachhead for getting Gaddafi to give up his WMD program. And we're pretty sure Musa Kusa had something to do with Pan Am 003. Uh, for me, I, I think, is, 
the question also becomes, is the juice worth the squeeze? <clears throat> Yeah, you know, what what possibly could we get? You know that we don't have a relationship, but all of a sudden, you know, somebody comes forward uh, and says, "Hey, uh, I want to share this or I want to share that." I would just be really, um, I, I just take a rather jaundiced view of why that person would uh, would want to come come forward, right? You know, most a lot of relationships. I mean, it is more art than science, and uh, you know, and and. Intelligence is often shared to you know, influence as much as it is to inform anyone, and so I would I would just be very very cautious, uh, you know, and, and and really try to figure out why you know why we're all of a sudden now having a cup of tea. Mr. Jir, could you give us an idea as an analyst? How would you deal with that issue, the issue of possible deception coming from intelligence that's coming from a foreign partner? Uh, so I think. Largely, you know, you have to look at the body of work, uh, or you know, the body of the relationship, and, and what it's produced to to a certain point, right? So it's, you know, you, you can't look at, at it in, in isolation, right? So where have we been with this or that service? What have they provided in the past? Uh, does the information triangulate from other sources, be it SIGINT or imagery, or you, you, you try to vet that information as best as you can? Uh, but if it were single source information, I, I would just put a giant red caveat on it. But, but I, think, uh, I think the nature of your question was not just a data point, but a relationship that may be proved. So I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, during the worst of times in Iraq, the foreign fighter pipeline through Syria was bad enough. We talked to Asaf Shakat, who is Bashar's brother-in-law, was killed in a suicide bombing at his headquarters once the current unpleasantness got underway. I mean, thoroughly <coughs> disreputable service, thoroughly disreputable man that foreign fighters were killing Americans. And, and, and how did that work out? Not well. Why? Because of the moral turpitude of the Syrian regime? No, because it was ineffective. We didn't get really good information. My name is Tara McKelvey, and I work for the BBC. And um, the presentations are really interesting. And I liked hearing about the creation myth, the way you're describing, and also whether or not the person you're talking to sees the creation myth that Americans have. And the question I have for you is you talked about tradecraft, the shared tradecraft between Brits and Americans. I work with Brits, so um, they're very similar to us, but also different. I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about the relationship in terms of tradecraft. Like, say, for example, Jihadi John, how would you assess the tradecraft used by Americans and by Brits? And then also quickly, you take it for, you talk about the way uh, the U.S. agencies share with the Brits, though they don't share with other Americans. Just explain more, because I don't understand why that is. Uh, so let me just start by saying I, I've been out of the government uh, in the intelligence capacity since uh, 2011, so I really can't say anything um, profound on Jihadi John. But uh, getting back to your, your bigger question of um, uh, you know, of, of how uh, why why the the philosophy matters, I think it's you know it, I don't know I'm, I'm an ice hockey player, right? So reduce my you know IQ accordingly, and uh, and for me if you're if you're on a team. Um, with with North Americans, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, people from the U.S. and people from Canada, you have the playing style that's just going to work well together without a lot of practice in advance. Um, if all of a sudden you put a Finn or a Czech or you know someone else, uh, uh, you know, someone from Switzerland maybe on your team, you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to adjust to their playing style. They're going to have to adjust to yours, and you're not going to be ready for the big game for a little while. That's not to say that that it can't happen. Um, let me give you one concrete example of, of tradecraft, um, and this has already been uh, pre-cleared by CIA in my, my, my dissertation, which is what I was <laughs> frantically hoping for. Um, so um, during the, the Oleg Pankovsky uh, operation, there, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of friction between the, the two sides. And, uh, and the Americans, right, we, we've, we're, we're American. We have our checklist, step one, step two, step three. And one of those steps um, you know, in the, in the so-called asset validation process uh, is to bust out the, um, uh, the the polygraph, and uh, you know we, you know, I, my my own opinion, um, I think is probably, I guess I shouldn't say, uh, but uh, let's just say that the the Brits don't like it. You know, the, the Americans use it for almost everything. It's a, you know, it is, you know, it it, it comes out of the closet real quick, um, and the the Brits just don't think they think it's witchcraft. They don't think it's 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 really effective. And so even in, in 1960, uh, 61 and 62, um, Oleg, the, 
but, you know, why is Oleg Pankovsky giving us all this information? Is he a dangle? Who is this guy? Uh, should we listen to him? And so the Americans said, aha, we have a technical solution for that. We've got this box and it reads your mind. And, uh, and the Brits were horrified, absolutely horrified, because it was, it was going to hurt, uh, they felt it was going to hurt the relationship with this guy. So he's coming forward, he's going to get a bullet in the back of the head, which he actually does do uh, if, if, he's, if, he's, uh, um, if, if he's exposed. So he's taking these, these great risks, and you know, the Americans still want to strap him up to the box. So uh, how it ultimately resolves is there, there are two Americans and two Brits on the team. They couldn't agree. And so it actually went up to, the, uh, to the, the director of central intelligence, Richard Helms, because the Americans weren't backing off and the Brits weren't backing off. And finally, there was a phone call between the DCI and, um, and the, the head of, of, of MI6, Sir Dick White. And uh, they, they, they agreed uh, to not, uh, not uh, break out the, 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 the polygraph. Uh, so when when there are when there are tradecraft differences, uh, sometimes it, you know it does need to be resolved at at very senior levels. So even though they, they work well together, uh, you know, 99 times out of 100, uh, you know, sometimes there is friction and it does need to get worked out. The um, NGA, NSA, DCHQ. Um, it, it's not that NSA was denying information to NGA. It's that NGA wasn't at Bletchley Park, and NGA had not had a decades long benefit of integration of every aspect. There, there were no trails beaten down in the forest between NSA and NGA. Their way, the trails have been beaten down over decades in the, in the common Five Eyes uh, intelligence relationship. Lots of hands. Uh, we're gonna go in the back, we'll alternate, we'll do gender alternation. <laughs> Wait, wasn't there someone in front of me, though? Well, I'll, what the hell. Um, my uh, undercover name, I guess, is James Bond. So thank you all for the, uh, for the forum. Actually, it's really Kaiser Sose. Um, thank you for the forum today. Uh, General, sir, your um, reputation precedes you. I have a number of buddies who are bookers and producers in the city, and you're one of the go-to guys when it comes to uh, foreign policy and surveillance. So thank you. I'll put my questions to you. Could you... Um, Take a survey of uh, Director Comey's comments regarding the iPhone, security protocols and, uh, in that device, and also uh, your views on the uh, reorganization and restructuring of the agency under Director Brennan. Thanks. Yeah, the iPhone was encryption unbreakable by Apple and, uh, and Google, right? Yeah. Um, it may surprise you. I probably have more of an open mind on the topic than the FBI director has suggested he has. I, I think he's pretty binary about it, and it can't go. Um, I'm willing to listen to arguments. That's a, that's a damn big ask of American industry, given the global situation after post-Snowden and so on. And so put me down as undecided, OK? But, but I suggest that to you because instinctively you probably expected me to be over here, and I'm quite willing to look at the broader, broader scope of arguments. Uh, what John has suggested to do at the agency, and, and we have, John had a conference call for people like me before he, the day before he told the workforce. Uh, every stitch of John's diagnosis of the issues facing CIA were absolutely familiar ground to me. All right, that, that on a good day, CIA is a collective noun. It's hardly ever a singular noun, and on bad days it's a plural in terms of cohesion because of the different directorates and the strong cultures that they have. That CIA people now have to check their digital persona at the fence line on Route 123 because they can't bring it in. And I'm not saying they should be able to text from there, but the, but the way they live their lives outside the fence line digitally is very different from how they're permitted to do it inside the fence line. So I can see he wants to embrace uh, the digital age in terms of tradecraft. And so um, creating centers in terms of focus. Um, every director in the last four has created a center, counterproliferation, counterterrorism. So you can see why he wants to do it. The challenge John will have now is to do that kind of really significant change at an agency that's probably working at about 115% capacity 
because of the demands of the current operational environment. Right here at the front. Uh, I'm Elaine Sereo, uh, Executive Director of Fate Squared. Thank you, gentlemen, for this uh, presentation today on intelligence sharing. Uh, can mutually, my question is, can mutually shared, uh, gathered and sh uh, analyzed uh, open source intelligence uh, foster um, a more, co you know, expansive uh, use uh, and aggressive use of intelligence sharing amongst the intelligence communities. Thank you. Any, any takers? What role does open, open source intelligence play in integrating or fostering intelligence sharing at the classified level. You guys are hesitating, so I'm jumping. Right. <laughs> um, I was hoping thank you would say. Uh, okay, very briefly. Um, the first cultural shift that has to take place is within the secret security services who give pride of place to information that has to be stolen as opposed to information that's generally available. So the first cultural shift is to recognize that an awful lot actually infinitely more the information you need to inform judgment is readily available if you just know where to look rather than have having to be stolen all right so it's the internal shift that takes place first once that is underway then i think it's a natural thing since you now have eased the burdens on what kind of sources and methods you might reveal by revealing your information that you might have richer intelligence sharing uh, amongst nations. Yeah, but the first, the first move is internal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's, there's no game really to be played, right? So we don't have to say, can we say that? Can we not say that? I don't know. Let me, let, let me, let me go back to my boss, right? Well, here it is. It's, you know, it's Twitter, it's the BBC, it's, it's you name it. And therefore, you, you keep your momentum versus saying, well, may, maybe we'll, we'll go have an emergency clearance session and we'll get back to you tomorrow. Uh, thank you. This is Jeff Stein from Newsweek. Uh, uh, General Hayden, uh, just for clarification on the Balawi operation and what happened at Coast, which was a dreadful aff affair, everyone agrees. Uh, did you mean to say that the uh, CIA did no vetting, independent vetting of Balawi? Did you mean no. to say that? No, Jeff. It, it, again, I'm, I'm basing this totally on Joby Warwick's book and your columns and, and, and other things that have been written. I mean, they're... they're he certainly was worked from his, from his origin as a, a Jordanian service source. And so I, I'm just suggesting that there, there's, there's an act of faith there before going, before going forward. I, I don't know enough details to, to say what was or wasn't done in terms of what was done with regard to vetting on our side. I don't know. Okay, and as a, as a quick follow-up, could you speak a little bit to the difficulty of vetting sources uh, in the Middle East and the ISIS <laughs> sure. quadrangle? Sure, it's very hard. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it is very hard. I mean, all human beings are complex individuals. Okay. You can occasionally get a happy person who's willing to spy. <laughs> but... But, but, it's not, but it's not the norm. <laughs> and, and so when you, when, you, when you go to someone, and f frankly, I, I mean, Jeff, you know this, you're suborning someone to betray an organization to which they normally owe loyalty. Right? That's, a, that's a complex character you're dealing with by, by, by definition. And, and particularly in a part of the world where loyalties run in directions that, that perhaps don't fit our patterns, you know, you and I as Westerners, Americans, it's, it's probably family, nation, you know. In other parts of the world, it's, it's tribe, religion, <laughs> family, nation, eh, maybe. <laughs> and, and so um, it just makes it more difficult for someone from our culture to thoroughly vet folks from other culture. Again, with the basic premise that, that, that it's not often that very well-adjusted, healthy, happy people volunteer to betray the organization of which they're a part. Thank you so much, General and gentlemen, for doing that. I'm working for French television, the French CNN Italy, part of Canal+. General, could you analyze for us the attacks on Charlie Hebdo, your reaction, 
and the rise of radical Islam in Europe, especially in France? That's an easy question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Jump in here, guys. <laughs> um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of what we're doing, in terms of talking about intelligence, intelligence sharing, and again, uh, I'm out of government six years now, plus. I'm just reflecting wh what I've seen. Uh, the French services are very good. Uh, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the language of Langley, we had a lot of time for D DGSE, right? And I, I know and become friends with several directors there. Uh, and so I, I don't know that this was a, a, a question, a flaw in intelligence sharing. And in fact, I know that the individuals had, have shown up on American radars as well as, as, well as French radars, and about as much as I can say. Uh, this was far more a question of French resources than it was the, how exquisite was French intelligence. Everybody's got to draw the line. You only have so many resources to, to really focus in on so many potential targets. And unfortunately, these guys were drawn below the line, even though they were known, and let me say this, commonly known to, to Western intelligence. Were you surprised? No. No. I, I think most folks like me viewed the Charlie Hebdo kinds of attacks as, as inevitable. Um, Anyway, let me, let, me, let me add an additional thought, since you're from French media. Um, and when one does the forensics, every one of those inevitable attacks was preventable. It's a little bit like Ebola. You know, somebody's got the disease, you can go back and deconstruct how they got it, and if only she had kind of closed the sleeve or not taken her cover off in a certain way, she wouldn't have contracted it. But the fact of the matter is there's a plague and people are going to get Ebola. And, and that's my view of the Charlie Hebdo kind of attack. Yeah, you can always look in the rearview mirror and say, if only this. But this stuff's inevitable. Professor Walsh, you want to jump in? You've written about intelligence sharing at the European level. Do you think well, this didn't seem to be a problem of intelligence sharing at the European level, but what kind of solutions do you think could be found for the European Union, or even just with, or even within NATO, for increasing intelligence sharing? Well, what's interesting about the European Union is is that you know it has extremely close levels of cooperation in some domains, like a single currency uh, and trade policy, but intelligence sharing seems to be an area that has um, has kind of lagged behind that. Um, and th there could be a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one could be that you know not all the EU states even have foreign intelligence services, uh, so there's sort of a, a question of who's going to be doing most of the heavy lifting there and who's going to be benefiting the most. Um, I think there's also issues of, uh, of how much how interested they are in cooperating with each other, how much benefit they can get from each other, and so it's it's I think it's proven kind of tricky for them to figure out a, a sort of structure that is as a uh, I was going to say as effective as the single currency, but that's really not the way to think about the single <laughs> currency as um, it's maybe coordinated as, a, as something like that. Yes, right there in the middle. That's, yes, please. Hi, um, I'm Sam Archer from a uh, graduate student at Georgetown um, in the School of Foreign Service. Uh, my question goes back to um, the comments made about the uh, foreign publics reacting very differently than intelligence services when it comes to sort of run-of-the-mill things like tapping, uh, may or may not have been tapping, uh, Chancellor, Chancellor Merkel's um, phone. My question is, um, does that discrepancy influence in any way the intelligence sharing relationship? Like, and specifically, did, did that case influence the German-American intelligence sharing relationship? Thanks. I'll, yeah. Please. It's, I brought up drinking yeah. in Munich um, while we were doing this. Um, it did, because in democracies, public opinion matters. And public opinion does affect policy. Um, you know, in my darker moments, I, I will describe some of the things that happened as necessary theater, but theater, all right? Um, on the other hand, the one thing I did learn at Munich 
was that although I may have thought the German response to this was overreacting, it was entirely genuine. And, and back to this and how much, um, I learned quickly that, that Germans seem to view privacy, we, we all view privacy as a right, but, but Germans seem to view privacy through the same lens that we Americans view freedom of speech and freedom of religion. And, and therefore, it's, it's got a different position on their taxonomy than it does on ours. And, and, so, and so it had a greater impact on German public opinion than maybe we felt warranted or we even anticipated. But knowing the value structure there, one now certainly understands that. I actually did a long article. I was interviewed for a long article in Der Spiegel. And the, and the, title, the, the title of the article was Shame on Us. And if, but if you read the article, it's shame on us, not for what we may or may not have done. It's shame on us for our inability to keep what we may or may not have done a secret. And that we pushed a very good friend into a very bad position by our failure to have operational security. And, and so that's, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> yes, right there in the middle with the dark suit. Yeah. Hi, Vince Houghton, International Spy Museum. I'd like to ask you, <laughs> hi, how you doing? Uh, a broader historical question about intelligence sharing, uh, about liaison, uh, and maybe the answer is all of the above, but I wonder if the relationships are formed more at the director level, at the, oper at the strategic level, or is it more the tactical operational level? Is it Stevenson and Donovan, or is it the guys in the field who are building a relationship and that works its way up to the higher levels? Uh, Thanks, Vince. I asked that question uh, during my research interviews. Um, I, I interviewed a lot of uh, former, um, mostly CIA and, and MI6 officers, but also across both intelligence communities. And I, I, can, I can say, at least for the Anglo-American relationship, um, that, that trust uh, and common understanding did percolate up, and it percolated back down as well. The, the, the leadership sort of sets the tone. And I think at, then at the working level, I mean, I've served as, as a liaison officer and if you, uh, to, in, my, in my mind, if you sort of feel that, that the leadership is going gonna, is gonna to back you or understand why you pushed this forward or you, you, you did what you did, um, you know, if, if they say, yeah, that's within the broad construct of the kind of relationship that we want, you know, yes, by all means, go ahead. Uh, but, uh, but alternatively, if, if, the, if the relationship is, al is already prickly, um, you know, th then I think, uh, you know, you, a working level officer is going to say, man, can I get in trouble for this? Can I get in trouble for that? And even if you wouldn't get in trouble for it, it's always in the back of your mind. And so you're gonna, if here's the line, you're going to stay well back from it. I, I think that's right. It can and does work, work both ways. My going away gift from the head of MI6 was a, an almost authentic looking copy of the cable sent by the British station chief here to MI6 headquarters uh, in London on the occasion of Bill Donovan's first visit to, to Great Britain. Incredibly candid, short, but very candid cable saying, although Catholic and a Republican, comma, <laughs> <laughs> he has the ear of the president and he's worth your time. <laughs> so it, it can go both ways. Yes, in the very, very far back on the left. Hi, uh, Jeff Morley, Arms Control today. Um, United States and Iran have a common enemy in ISIS, General Hayden. I'm wondering, uh, do you think the United States should share intelligence with Iran? And you talked about assessing payoff and risk. How would you assess payoff and risk in this particular example? Look, there's, there's, always, a, there's always a duty to warn. And, and therefore, when, when lives are at risk, you have both a legal and ethical responsibility in the American system to pr try to prevent the loss of life, particularly innocent life. Putting that aside, all right, boxing that off, I think my answer to your question is no, because I, I don't think we have common objectives here. The current offensive against Tikrit is, a, I think, a very good example. Uh, we'd love the Iraqi government to take Tikrit back. It's a prelude to taking Mosul back. But to take Tikrit back with a Shia army 
conquering a Sunni community is not consistent with American interests in Iraq. And so I would not. Yes, right up front here. Sorry, I'm making you walk back and forth. <laughs> Hi, my name's Hugh McElrath. I'm a retired intelligence officer. And so my question is based on something I read in the Washington Post. I'm sorry, we can't get away from Angela Merkel's phone. What I saw in the Post was that yeah, there was the issue, you know, if you want to know what I think, just ask me. But then the article hinted that what the Germans sought was something more like a five eyes relationship. And I take from that that they wanted a no spy rule. Is, is there anything that any of you can say usefully on that? Me. Well, there's, there's, three of you. there's three of you. I read the same article as he did. So. <laughs> um, that's never going to happen. Okay, and and but well, one o five means five, <laughs> and I don't think it can ever be six. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that's not our arrangement. It's an arrangement amongst five nations who have agreed to a deeper degree of trust and transparency and revealing weaknesses, I mean, you know, the things you don't know. And so it's, you know, make all the trips to Washington you want. We, we don't hold the keys to making five, six. So that, that's one. Um, secondly, in, all, in this late night, it really was a genuine session of the security conference in, in the nightclub after, after dinner. Um, I made the point that, um, okay, Germans are angry, angry and asked what justification would we have had if we were listening to Chancellor Merkel? And my response then was, um, how about Schroeder? Okay, who was not Merkel and who opposed American policy in Iraq and seemed to have a strange and mutually productive relationship with Vladimir Putin. And what about that billion euro zone, uh, loan that was guaranteed shortly before he left government for Gazprom and Nord Stream? And then what board did he get on after he left government? Okay. So I asked my German friends, so what do you think? Intelligent statecraft or something different? And so I, I guess I was reserving the right of the United States um, to conduct espionage for the security of the United States at the discretion of the United States. Balanced, of course. I mean, this is not done in a vacuum. I was waved off of targets for what I would call broader policy reasons when I was director of NSA. That happens all the time. But that's a national decision, not, not part of some international arrangement. Uh, yes, all of that. Um, <laughs> uh, but also, I think that you can't short circuit historical processes you know, where, where, is the, where is the common threat? Where is the common development? How did they intertwine? How was the process reified and brought into being through, uh, you know, through, through shared experience and through the most dire shared experiences? Uh, you know, just because you, you kind of want to make something so, or even if, even if you wanted to make it so at the policy level, there's so much, I mean, that's why I use the hedgerow analogy. They're so intertwined that it's almost impossible to, 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 to disentangle it. And, and so I think, you know, if, I don't think you, I think five is five because you can't add or subtract without uh, a shared, an, an honest to goodness shared threat and a continued glue, um, you know, from that. So for instance, I, you know, I don't think the Germans view Russia in the same way that, that America does, um, and certainly not as an existential threat. We haven't really seen, you know, no kidding, existential threats since World War II and the Cold War. And so now to add something for, for policy or, or political considerations, I think, I think it's asking too much, and it asks more than the history can, can support. The, the integration is really quite, quite something to behold, and it built up over decades. And again, began at Bletchley, but, but it went on. Um, absent a few special niches, we never knew anything about what 
British intelligence may or may not have been doing in Northern Ireland. That was absolutely off limits. By the same token, when the Stella Wind program, that's the NSA surveillance program uh, in the United States was made public, David Pepper, who was the head of GCHQ, came to visit me and he walked in and paid me the, the, the greatest compliment he could ever pay another intelligence officer. Michael, we had no idea. Okay. <laughs> absent that though, absent those real significant carve-outs, it would be almost impossible for NSA, GCHQ to undertake activities not visible to, other, to the other partners. There's also something of a paradox when a country comes to you and asks you, please don't spy on us, we won't spy on you. Implicitly, that means that they're not getting much information on you to begin <laughs> with. So it, it's really hard to get these no spy agreements going in the first place. Another question in the back. I see a hand up there. I'm Howard Wiarda from CSIS. Uh, back to the Intel reform that was announced the other day. Could you please clarify something for me? Because it was very confusing in the news account, maybe purposely so. Uh, one paragraph announced that the regional centers were going to be abolished, and the next paragraph announced that they were going to be um, strengthened. Which is it? Do we know? Could you shed some light on, on the, the area or the regional centers and their fate, my, please? My, my understanding is John's going to create 10 centers, four by topic, terrorism, uh, proliferation, global issues, one will, come, one will come to mind, and then six by geographic areas, and that he will task organize within each of those centers the DO, DI, DS&T people responsible for each of, those, each of those areas. If anything is disestablished, my understanding is it would be the Middle East Bureau inside the DO and the equivalent bureau inside the DI. And so, and so the, the DO and DI, which will continue to exist, are the, the case officers and the analysts and the support and so on, although they will continue to exist, they will be what, I'm making this part up now, but I think it's a good reflection of what John's trying to do. They will be the CIA equivalent of the military departments inside DOD. They, they, they are responsible for training, organize, equip, and providing forces. But the forces will be fought by the combatant commanders, which in the CIA new system will be the center, center directors. The, the, the issue John will have is, is he's leaving enough throw weight in the old DO, DI, DS, and DS, and T to, to, kin, to continue to create the kind of talent that the centers will continue to rely on in order to task organize to do their mission. So you've got, you've got this critical balance, which in DOD is taken care of by having an Army, Navy, and Air Force who do nothing but create combat power, and then combatant commanders who do nothing except use it. John's now governing an organization that's responsible for both, and he's shifting the emphasis from the creation of espionage power to the use of espionage power. That sounded okay. I, that makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we have time for, I guess, a couple more. Yes, right there. Could you please wait for the microphone? Thank you. What happened to the Korean missionaries in Afghanistan? Uh, they actually got home. Um, we didn't have insight into it, but I think the Koreans paid for it. But I don't know that for a fact. I, I, I really don't. It's not me trying to be oblique. I just don't know. One of the most telling, one of the most telling moments I had though, was when the head of NIS is in there, and he said, "I, I need your help. You guys know this country. I don't. I'm going to go to Kabul next. Can I get your help?" Uh, and I, I said, you bet, Mr. Minister, I'm going, to give you, I'm, I'm going to give you a CIA case officer to go with you who knows Afghanistan backward and forward. Great. Here he is. And then he said, in Hangul, does he speak Korean? 
and the officer to my right responded to him without waiting for the translation. That's what it means to be a global intelligence service. Yes, right here. Last question. Please, the microphone. Following up on your, uh, your acknowledgement from, I guess it was GCS, GCHQ, you know, commending you on that one project. So then what would you say to Kaspersky's labs uh, revealing or discovering the equation group for what they right. deem that? Yeah. Um, I would say Kaspersky Labs has done what Kaspersky Labs was organized to do and what I would expect Kaspersky Lab to do. That's different from someone on the inside betraying secrets they've sworn to protect. Any last thoughts from our panelists? No? Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much.